Let's start talking about question answering, and in particular, what are the kinds of question answering tasks that are out there? First, let me start off by saying what we're not talking about. There are many question answering data sets out there that are essentially logic problems or SQL query lookups, and we're not going to talk about them. That's a very valid form of question answering, and it essentially corresponds to a form of parsing, where you have some text and you need to turn that into a logical form or an SQL statement, and then from that you get the answer. And so there it's not as open-ended, not as open domain, it's usually restricted to a small set of problems like, for example, geometry problems. So we're not going to talk about that, that's a very interesting line of research, but we're going to talk about more open-ended question answering, in particular, machine reading question answering, where you need to make sense of a large body of text to be able to answer questions. And you need to be able to answer questions about anything. We'll talk more about the specific models in the next video. But for the moment, think about the kinds of things that your model would need to do. It needs to have a representation of the question, and it needs to have a representation of the text that it's reading. And it needs to be able to find the relevant pieces of text to be able to read it. And of course, when a machine reads a piece of text, it's not doing the same high-level processing and reading that we're doing. And so even though it's not going to do that, we are going to evaluate it based on whether it gets the question right. One of the first machine reading data sets was the CNN Daily Mail data set from Kalmanitz Hermann and company. And so here you have a bunch of news articles and they asked you to answer questions about those news articles. So it was very localized to an individual document and there were questions like, who reached the Cricket World Cup? And you would have to answer New Zealand and the answer was somewhere in the document. And so the nice thing about this is that it anonymized the entities so that you didn't use a bunch of world knowledge and, and essentially language models to fill in the blanks. But there were relatively few possible answers that could fill in the blank. So it really was essentially a multiple choice question. You identified the entities in the paragraph and then you picked which one was correct. And, and that introduced a little bit of noise to the problem. The great thing about this data set, however, is that it jump-started a whole new field of natural language processing, and it helped us create better data sets and inspired other researchers to create data sets that might do a little bit better. And so for this data set and all of the data sets I'll be talking about today, we're going to talk about the pros and the cons of the data set so that you can have a sense of what the lay of the land is. I've stolen most of the insights in this video from Phil Blunsom, who created the original slides. That said, I agree with his observations, and uh, at the end I will add my own. Another dataset is Narrative QA, where you have a summary of a movie or a snippet from the screenplay, and you then need to answer questions about either the summary or the screenplay. So how is Oscar related to Dana? And then the answer is he is her son. So the great thing about this data set is that it requires a large amount of reasoning and you also need to understand temporal evolution in the course of a story. The downside is that this is way too hard and this data set is too small. So the models that we have can't answer this task and models that maybe could answer this task given sufficient data don't have enough examples to do well on this task. So it's not really that useful for researchers to hill climb on. So a good question answering data set is one that you can solve okay right now, but there's a long potential to improve. This data set is so hard that we can't really hill climb. But small data sets can be useful for transferring knowledge from one domain to another. So you could imagine taking information from Wikipedia and the web and trying to use that to answer these narrative QA questions. And that would be great, but 
it's a much more difficult problem and it's harder to evaluate directly on this data set. But again, this data set is so small that it's really hard to tell if that's working. Another question answering data set is MS Marco. And these are questions that people have put into search queries. Then you evaluate how good the answer is. There is another late breaking data set called Google Natural Questions that is even larger and just came out recently. So recently I haven't put it in the slides yet. So the good thing about this is that these are real questions that real human beings have asked. So the previous data sets that I talked about are questions created by crowd workers. And crowd workers aren't all that inventive in creating questions. And the things that they're asking about may not be relevant to what people would actually want to know about a story. And that's great. This means that people actually care about this. But the, the problem is that search engines have trained people over years to answer questions themselves. And so no one gets good answers when they type in a question like, what is the last capital in Western Europe to be invaded by a foreign army? So if you type that into Google, you likely will not get an answer to that question directly. So you'll query other things instead so that you yourself can answer that question. The failure of search engines to answer questions over the last couple of decades limits the usefulness of the kinds of questions that you can get from search engines. The other nice thing about this is that there are unrestricted answers. Anything could be an answer. But then the hard part is how do you then evaluate those answers? You can't do string matching or things like that. USA and United States of America could both be the answer to the same question, but if you're string matching against USA, that's not going to give you a satisfying response. The most famous and well-known data set for machine reading is probably Squad, the Stanford question answering data set. This is the gold standard. If you don't report results on Squad, you need to explain why. These questions use paragraphs from Wikipedia, ask crowd workers to write questions about that paragraph. The answer is a span within that Wikipedia paragraph. This is a very large data set, so it doesn't have many of the problems of the smaller data sets that we've talked about before. The downside of this is that these crowd workers can often be reverse engineered. There are tricks and cheats that they use to create questions really quickly. A lot of the machine learning algorithms are essentially reverse engineering those annotators rather than solving the intrinsic problem. The reason that Squad has become the gold standard is that it has a very well-trafficked leaderboard where people can submit their systems and to see how they stack up against the rest of the world. Because the answers are spans within the original document, this reduces the task to multiple choice, much like the Daily Mail CNN data set that we talked about at the very beginning. This means that it doesn't allow answers that are latent in the text that don't correspond to a fixed span within the document. One personal pet peeve that I have with Squad is that there is a quote unquote human upper bound. This isn't the fault of the researchers who created Squad, but there are many less well-informed news organizations or promoters of research that mischaracterize what it means to be near the human bound. It also mischaracterizes what it means to read a document. If machine learning systems are getting close to this human bound, it doesn't mean that computers are reading better than humans. It means that computers are doing a better job of highlighting particular passages better than underpaid crowd workers. So let's now turn to my hobby horse, Quiz Bowl. So this is the form of question answering that I am trying to champion. So I am very biased here. It is the gold standard in human question answering. So as a result, we get a lot of free data from experts. These are not crowd workers. These are people who are passionate about human question answering. And we're using their expertise and their experience to improve computer question answering. Now the downside is that sometimes what's difficult for a human isn't difficult for a computer. And again, just like Squad, there are sometimes easily solved questions that are intended to be difficult but aren't actually. One good aspect of Quiz Bowl is that it's not tied to an individual Wikipedia page or a news article or anything like that. So this means that 
in the human competition, people have to know this off the top of their heads, thus it's not tied to a particular piece of text. This makes it a little bit harder for computer systems. We need to do some sort of post hoc connection using information retrieval or something like that to find the relevant passages and extract answers out of that if we want to do machine reading. And because the game is structured to facilitate comparison among humans to find out who knows most about a topic, this setup also corresponds to direct comparison between humans and computers. It makes sense to compare how many words does a human take to answer a question versus how many words does a computer take to answer a question. The downside is that it's slightly more cumbersome to have a computer do this task. If you're doing a bidirectional LSTM, there's a little more computational overhead. For any individual question, you're actually asking many different sub instances of that same question that increases the computational overhead. Maybe at test time that's not so bad, but at training this can be more expensive. This is not to say that this is the last word in machine reading for question answering. This is moving very quickly and new data sets are being created all the time. Uh, I want to reuse this video, so I'll put links to more recent videos in the video description so that I don't have to re-record the video. But there are a number of trends that I think that we'll see in the near future. How do you make systems that are more robust to noise, either from annotators or from messy text on the web or that are robust to adversarial crafting of questions. I think we'll also see more data sets that depend on logical reasonings, so having to make multiple jumps in logic to answer the question. And I think that we'll also see diverse domains, so conversational question answering like you would have in a long session with uh, Google Assistant or Siri or Echo. I think we'll also see very specific domains like medical question answering or scientific question answering where you're trying to answer specific domain questions in an open-ended way.